The Yellow Dwarf, from the Blue Fairy Book, published by Andrew Lang and Lenora Blanche Allen. Part 1 Once upon a time there lived a queen who had been the mother of a great many children, and of all of them only one daughter was left. But then she was worth at least a thousand. Her mother, who, since the death of the king, her father, had nothing in the world she cared for so much as this little princess, was so terribly afraid of losing her that she quite spoiled her, and never tried to correct any of her faults. The consequence was that this little person, who was as pretty as possible, and was one day to wear a crown, grew up so proud and so much in love with her own beauty that she despised everyone else in the world. The queen, her mother, by her caresses and flatteries, helped to make her believe that there was nothing too good for her. She was dressed almost always in the prettiest frocks, as a fairy, or as a queen going out to hunt and the ladies of the court followed her dressed as forest fairies. And to make her more vain than ever, the queen caused her portrait to be taken by the cleverest painters and sent it to several neighbouring kings with whom she was very friendly. When they saw this portrait, they fell in love with the princess, every one of them. But upon each it had a different effect. One fell ill, one went quite crazy, and a few of the luckiest set off to see her as soon as possible. But these poor princes became her slaves the moment that they set eyes on her. Never has there been a gayer court. Twenty delightful kings did everything they could think of to make themselves agreeable and after having spent ever so much money in giving a single entertainment, thought themselves very lucky if the princess said, not pretty. All of this admiration vastly pleased the queen, and not a day passed where she didn't receive seven or eight thousand sonnets, and as many elegies, madrigals, and songs, which were sent to her by all the poets in the world. All the prose and the poetry that was written was about Bellissima, for that was the princess's name, and all the bonfires that they had were made of these verses, which crackled and sparked better than any other sort of wood. Bellissima was already fifteen years old, and every one of the princes wished to marry her, but no one dared to say so. How could they when they knew that any of them might have cut his head off five or six times a day just to please her? And she would have thought it a mere trifle, so little did she care. You may imagine how hard-hearted her lovers thought her, and the queen, who wished to see her married, did not know how to persuade her to think of it seriously. Bellissima, she said. I do wish you not to be so proud. What makes you despise all of these nice kings? I wish you to marry one of them, and you do not try to please me. I am so happy, Bellissima answered. Do leave me in peace, madame. I don't want to care for anyone. But you would be very happy with any of these princes, said the queen and I shall be very angry if you fall in love with anyone who is not worthy of you. But the princess thought so much of herself that she did not consider any one of her lovers clever or handsome enough for her, and her mother, who was getting really angry at her determination not to be married, began to wish that she had not allowed her to have her own way so much. At last, Not knowing what else to do, she resolved to consult a certain witch who was called the Fairy of the Desert. Now, this was very difficult to do, 
as she was guarded by some terrible lions. But happily, the queen had heard a long time before that whoever wanted to pass these lions safely must throw to them a cake made of millet flour, sugar candy, and crocodile's eggs. This cake she prepared with her own hands and put it into a little basket. She set out to seek the fairy. But as she was not used to walking so far, she soon felt very tired and sat down at the foot of a tree to rest and presently fell fast asleep. When she awoke, she was dismayed to find her basket empty. The cake was all gone. And to make matters worse, at that moment she heard the roaring of the great lions who had found out that she was near and they were coming to look for her. Oh, what shall I do? she cried. I shall be eaten up. And, being too frightened to run a single step, she began to cry and leaned against the tree under which she had been asleep. Then she heard someone say, <coughs> She looked all round her and then up the tree and there she saw a tiny little man who was eating oranges. Oh, Queen, said he, I know you very well, and I know how much afraid you are of the lions. And you're quite right too, for they've eaten many other people. And what can you expect, as you've not any cake to give them? I must make up my mind to die, said the poor Queen. Alas, I should not care so much if only my dear daughter were married. Oh, you have a daughter, cried the yellow dwarf, who was so called because he was a dwarf and had such a yellow face and lived in the orange tree. I'm really glad to hear that, for I've been looking for a wife all over the world. Now, if you promise that she'll marry me, not one of the lions, tigers, or bears shall touch you. The queen looked at him and was almost as much afraid of his ugly little face as she had been of the lions before, so that she could not speak a word. What? You hesitate, madam, cried the dwarf. You must be very fond of being eaten up alive. And, as he spoke, the queen saw the lions, which were running down a hill towards them. Each one had two heads, eight feet, and four rows of teeth, and their skins were as hard as turtle shells and bright red. At this dreadful sight, the poor queen, who was trembling like a dove when it sees a hawk, cried out as loud as she could, Oh, dear Mr. Dwarf! Bellissima shall marry you. Oh, indeed she will, said he disdainfully. Bellissima is pretty enough, but I don't particularly want to marry her. You can keep her. Oh, noble sir, cried the queen in great distress. Do not refuse her. She is the most charming princess in the world. Oh, well, he replied. Out of charity, I'll take her, but be sure you don't forget that she's mine. As he spoke, a little door in the trunk of the orange tree opened, and in rushed the queen, only just in time, and the door shut with a bang in the faces of the lions. The queen was so confused that at first she did not notice another little door in the orange tree. But presently it opened, and she found herself in a field of thistles and nettles. It was encircled by a muddy ditch, and a little further on was a tiny thatched cottage, out of which came the yellow dwarf with a very jaunty air. He wore wooden shoes and a little yellow coat, and as he had no hair and very long ears, he looked altogether a shocking little object. 
I am delighted, said he to the queen, that as you are to be my mother-in-law, you should see the little house in which your Bellissima will live with me. With these thistles and nettles she can feed a donkey, which she can ride whenever she likes. Under this humble roof no weather can hurt her. She will drink the water of this brook and eat frogs, which grow very fat about here, and then she will always have me by her side, as handsome, agreeable, and gay as you see me now. If her shadow stays by her more closely than I do, I shall be surprised. The unhappy queen, seeing all at once what a miserable life her daughter would have with this dwarf, could not bear the idea, and fell down insensible without saying a word. When she revived, she found to her great surprise that she was lying in her own bed at home. And, what was more, that she had on the loveliest lace nightcap that she had ever seen in her life. At first she thought that all her adventures, the terrible lions, and her promise to the yellow dwarf that he should marry Bellissima, must have been a dream. But there was the new cap, with its beautiful ribbon and lace, to remind her that it was all true. This made her so unhappy that she could neither eat, drink, nor sleep for thinking of it. The princess, who, in spite of her willfulness, really loved her mother with all her heart, was much grieved when she saw her looking so sad, and often asked her what was the matter. But the queen, who didn't want her to find out the truth, only said that she was ill or that one of her neighbours was threatening to make war against her. Bellissima quite knew well that something was being hidden from her, and that neither of these was the real reason of the queen's uneasiness. So she made up her mind that she would go and consult the fairy of the desert about it, especially as she had heard how wise she was, and she thought that at the same time she might ask her advice as to whether it would be well to be married or not. So with great care she made some of the proper cake to pacify the lions and one night went up to her room very early, pretending that she was going to bed. But instead of that, she wrapped herself in a long white veil and went down a secret staircase and set off all by herself to find the witch. But when she got as far as the same fatal orange tree and saw it covered with flowers and fruit, she stopped and began to gather some of the oranges, and then, putting down her basket, she sat down to eat them. But when it was time to go on again, the basket had disappeared, and though she looked everywhere, not a trace of it could she find. The more she hunted for it, the more frightened she got, and at last she began to cry. Then, all at once, she saw before her the yellow dwarf. What's the matter with you, my pretty one? said he. What are you crying about? Alas, she answered, no wonder that I am crying, seeing that I have lost the basket of cake that was to help me to get safely to the cave of the fairy of the desert. And what do you want with her, pretty one? said the little monster. For I am a friend of hers, and for the matter of that, I am quite as clever as she is. The queen, my mother, replied the princess, has fallen lately into such a deep sadness that I fear that she will die, and I am afraid that perhaps I am the cause of it, for she very much wishes me to be married. And I must tell you, truly, that as yet I have not found anyone I consider worthy to be my husband. So for all these reasons I wish to talk to the fairy. Do not give yourself any further trouble, princess, answered the dwarf. I can tell you all you want to know better than she could. The queen, your mother, 
has promised you in marriage. Has promised me, interrupted the princess. Oh no, I'm sure she has not. She would have told me if she had. I am too much interested in the matter for her to promise anything without my consent. You must be mistaken. Oh, beautiful princess, cried the dwarf suddenly, throwing himself to his knees before her. I flatter myself that you will not be displeased at her choice when I tell you that it is to me she has promised the happiness of marrying you. You? cried Bellissima, starting back. My mother wishes me to marry you. How can you be so silly to think such a thing? Oh, well, it isn't that I care much to have that honour, cried the dwarf angrily. But here are the lions coming. I'll eat you up in three mouthfuls, and there will be an end to you and your pride. And indeed, at that moment, the poor princess heard the dreadful howls coming nearer and nearer. What shall I do? she cried. Must all my happy days come to an end like this? The malicious dwarf looked at her and began to laugh spitefully. <laughs> at least, said he, you have the satisfaction of dying unmarried. A lovely princess like you must surely prefer to die rather than be the wife of a poor little dwarf like myself. Oh, don't be angry with me, cried the princess, clasping her hands. I'd rather marry all the dwarfs in the world than die in this horrible way. Look at me well, princess, before you give me your word, said he. I don't want you to promise me in a hurry. Oh, she cried, the lions are coming. I have looked at you enough. I am so frightened. Save me this minute or I shall die in terror. Indeed, as she spoke, she fell down insensible, and when she recovered she found herself in her own little bed at home. How she got there she could not tell, but she was dressed in the most beautiful lace and ribbons, and on her finger was a little ring made of a single red hair, which fitted so tightly that if she tried as she might, she could not get it off. When the princess saw all of these things and remembered what had happened, she, too, fell into the deepest sadness, which surprised and alarmed the whole court, and the queen more than anyone else. A hundred times she asked Bellissima if anything was the matter with her, but she always said that there was nothing. At last, the chief men of the kingdom, anxious to see their princess married, sent the queen to beg her to choose a husband for her as soon as possible. She replied that nothing would please her better, but that her daughter seemed so unwilling to marry and she recommended them go talk to the princess about it themselves, so they did this at once. Now, Bellissima was much less proud since her adventure with the yellow dwarf, and she could not think of a better way of getting rid of the little monster than to marry some powerful king. Therefore, she replied much more favourably to their request than they had hoped, saying that though she was very happy as she was, still, to please them, she would consent to marry the king of the gold mines. Now, he was a very handsome and powerful prince, who had been in love with the princess for years, but had not thought that she would ever care about him at all. You can easily imagine how delighted he was when he heard the news and how angry it made all the other kings to lose forever the hope of marrying the princess. But, after all, Bellissima could not have married twenty kings. Indeed, she had found it quite difficult enough to choose one, for her vanity made her believe that there was nobody in the world who was worthy of her. Preparations were begun at once, for the grandest wedding that had ever been held at the palace. 
the king of the gold mines sent such immense sums of money that the whole sea was covered with ships that brought it. Messengers were sent to all the gayest and most refined courts, particularly to the court of France, to seek out everything rare and precious to adorn the princess. Although her beauty was so perfect that nothing she wore could make her look prettier. At least, that is what the king of the gold mines thought, and he was never happy unless he was with her. As for the princess, the more she saw of the king, the more she liked him. He was so generous, so handsome and clever, that at last she was almost as much in love with him as he was with her. How happy they were as they wandered about in this beautiful garden together sometimes listening to sweet music. And the king used to write songs for Bellissima. This is one that she liked very much. In the forest all is gay when my princess walks that way. All the blossoms then are found down with fluttering to the ground. Hoping she may tread on them and bright flowers with a slender stem. Gaze up at her as she passes, brushing lightly through the grasses. Oh, my princess, birds above, echo all back our songs of love as through this enchanted land. Blythe we wander, hand in hand. They really were as happy as the day was long. All the king's unsuccessful rivals had gone home in despair. They said goodbye to the princess so sadly that she could not help being sorry for them. Oh, madame, the king of the gold mines said to her. How is this? Why do you waste your pity on princes who love you so much that all their trouble would be well repaid by a single smile from you? I should be sorry, answered Bellissima. If you had not noticed how much I pitied these princes who are leaving me forever, but for you, sire, it is very different. You have every reason to be pleased with me, but they are going sorrowfully away so you must not grudge them for my compassion. The king of the gold mines was quite overcome by the princess's good-natured way of taking his interference and, throwing himself at her feet, he kissed her hand a thousand times and begged her to forgive him. At last the happy day came. Everything was ready for Bellissima's wedding. The trumpet sounded, all the streets of the town were hung with flags and strewn with flowers, and the people ran in crowds to the great square before the palace. The queen was so overjoyed that she had hardly been able to sleep at all, and she got up before it was light to give the necessary orders to choose the jewels that the princess was to wear. These were nothing less than diamonds, even on her shoes which were covered in them, and her dress of silver brocade was embroidered with a dozen of the sun's rays. You may imagine how much these had cost, but then nothing could have been more brilliant except the beauty of the princess. Upon her head she wore a splendid crown, her lovely hair waved nearly to her feet, and her stately figure could easily be distinguished among all the ladies who attended her. The king of the gold mines was not less noble and splendid. It was easy to see by his face how happy he was, and everyone who went near him returned loaded with presents, for all around the great banqueting hall had been arranged a thousand barrels of gold, and numberless bags made of velvet embroidered with pearls and filled with money each one containing at least a hundred thousand gold pieces, which were given away to everyone who liked to hold out his hand, which numbers of people hastened to do, you may be sure. 
Indeed, some found this by far the most amusing part of the wedding festivities. The queen and the princess were just ready to set out with the king when they saw, advancing towards them from the end of the long gallery, two great basilisks, dragging after them a very badly made box. Behind them came a tall old woman, whose ugliness was even more surprising than her extreme old age. She wore a ruff of black taffeta, a red velvet hood, and a farthingale all in rags, and she leaned heavily upon a crutch. This strange old woman, without saying a single word, hobbled three times round the gallery, followed by the basilisks, then, stopping in the middle and brandishing her crutch threateningly, she cried, Ah, oh, queen, ah, oh, princess, do you think you're going to break with impunity the promise that you made to my friend the yellow dwarf? I am the fairy of the desert. Without the yellow dwarf and his orange tree, my great lions would soon have eaten you up, I can tell you. And in Fairyland, we do not suffer ourselves to be insulted like this. Make up your minds at once what you'll do, for I vow that you shall marry the Yellow Dwarf. If you don't, may I burn my crutch. Ah, oh, Princess, said the Queen, weeping. What is it that I hear? What have you promised? Ah, oh, my mother, replied Bellissima sadly. What did you promise yourself? The king of the gold mines, indignant at being kept from his happiness by this wicked old woman, went up to her and threatening her with his sword, said, Get away, out of my country at once, and forever, miserable creature, lest I take your life and so rid myself of your malice. He had hardly spoken these words when the lid of the box fell open onto the floor with a terrible noise, and to their horror out sprang the yellow dwarf, mounted upon a great Spanish cat. You rash youth, he cried, rushing between the fairy of the desert and the king. Dare to lay a finger upon this illustrious fairy. Your quarrel is with me only. I am your enemy and your rival. That faithless princess who would have married you is promised to me. See if she has not upon her finger a ring made of one of my hairs. Just try to take it off, and you will soon find out that I am more powerful than you are. You wretched little monster, said the king. Do you dare to call yourself the princess's lover? and to lay claim to such a treasure? Do you know that you are a dwarf, that you are so ugly that you cannot bear to look at you, and that I should have killed you myself long before this, if you had been worthy of such a glorious death? The yellow dwarf, deeply enraged at his words, set spurs to his cat, which yelled horribly, and leaped hither and thither, terrifying everyone except the brave king, who pursued the dwarf closely, till he, drawing a great knife with which he was armed, challenged the king to meet him in single combat, and rushed down into the courtyard of the palace with a terrible clatter. The king, quite provoked, followed him hastily, but they had hardly taken their places facing one another, and the whole court had only just the time to rush out upon the balconies to watch what was going on, when suddenly the sun became as red as blood, and it was so dark that they could scarcely see at all. The thunder crashed, and the lightning seemed as if it must burn up everything. The two basilisks appeared, one on either side of the dwarf, like giants, mountains high, and fire flew from their mouths and ears, until they looked like flaming furnaces. None of these things could terrify the noble young king, and the boldness of his looks and actions reassured those who were looking on, and perhaps even embarrassed the yellow dwarf himself. 
But even his courage gave way when he saw what was happening to his beloved princess. For the fairy of the desert, looking more terrible than before, mounted upon a winged griffin, and with long snakes coiled around her neck, had given her such a blow with the lance she carried, that Bellissima fell into the queen's arms, bleeding and senseless. Her fond mother, feeling as much hurt by the blow as the princess herself, uttered such piercing cries and lamentations that the king, hearing them, entirely lost his courage and presence of mind. 